Um, I think a lot of people with the great weather are probably sipping some cold beverages out there. Um, I know that's what I would be doing, I think, but uh, really appreciate uh, everyone uh, joining here for uh, this talk, Accelerating Software-Defined Vehicles Through Open Source Software. Uh, my name is Dan Koshi. I'm the Executive Director and General Manager of Automotive at Linux Foundation, uh, and specifically, I'm uh, the head of Automotive Grade Linux. And a few words about me. Um, I was the VPGM of uh, uh, automotive at a company called Montevista, which some of you may have heard. Uh, we were the very first company in the world to put Linux in a vehicle, which was the Cadillac Q system and the Chevy Volt. Uh, I was also the head of mobile Linux at Montevista, which was the first, we were the first to put Linux in a mobile phone, which was the Motorola Razor uh, flip phone, which is a super successful phone. Uh, and then Android came along and, you know, killed the rest of the industry. <laughs> um, no, but jokes aside, uh, that, that was a really fun time for Linux because it was the very early days of embedded Linux where people thought, you're going to put Linux in a what? In a device? That's impossible. And look at where we are today where we're deployed in literally hundreds of millions of devices worldwide. Uh, I'm a Canadian, but I live in San Jose because it's too cold in Canada, although I have to say the weather in Vancouver this week is pretty nice. Okay, so with that out of the way, um, I'd like to start by asking people, you know, why is it that we buy a vehicle, which is one of the most expensive purchases of our lives, and we buy a $20 sticky cup, and we stick it in the windshield, and we put our iPhone or our Android phone. Everybody does this, and the reason we do this is because, let's face it, the software in the car sucks. Okay, it has sucked for many years. It doesn't, has not kept up with the expectations of the consumer and the expectations that we have as mobile phone owners where apps are readily available, upgrades are easy. You know, these things are just starting to, to surface now in vehicles. But for many, many years, you just didn't have that experience. And the reason we got in this predicament is because of fragmentation. So, the industry was plagued with too many operating systems all across the board. Operating systems for instrument clusters, some for infotainment, some for other features. And even within a single car company, you could have some cars using QNX, some cars using Linux, some cars using Microsoft, some cars using proprietary RTOS. And this fragmentation really hindered the innovation. And this is why the car companies have not been able to keep up with the mobile phone, with the mobile experience. And this is why automotive grade Linux was created. It's to alleviate this problem. So um, for those that are new, I'm going to introduce, uh, you know, at a high level what automotive grade Linux is. And then I'm going to dive into some of the features and things that we're working on these days and some of the exciting upcoming things that uh, will be coming up in the next couple of years. So what is AGL? Well, we're a nonprofit, as you would expect. We're an open source Linux based collaborative project focused entirely on vehicle software. We're hosted at Linux Foundation. We happen to be, I don't know where we stand these days, but definitely a top five projects in terms of membership and revenue and things like that. In fact, uh, we reached 100 members before CNCF did, and uh, I had a bet with Chris uh, uh, Anichek from CNCF, and he owes me a bottle of scotch that he still hasn't paid me. But um, <laughs> anyway, so AGL is quite a big project, and the goal of AGL is to build a single software platform for the whole industry to really eliminate this fragmentation. And so we like to characterize it as developing 70 to 80% of the starting point for a production project. Now, we're never going to be like production quality where you download AGL directly into the car. That's not the goal of the project because that's, frankly, that's too heavy lifting. Um, instead, what we want to be is that all of the common bits like the kernel, the device drivers for a given piece of hardware are common to everyone. The middleware for telephony, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi stacks, LTE, you know, all these, these, these necessary features should be shared and common to everyone. And then the APIs for things like speech recognition, navigation, radio, telephony, all of these APIs should be common to everyone. Then the manufacturer takes AGL with their tier one suppliers, and they add their favorite map provider, their favorite speech recognition provider. And because 
AGL is so ubiquitous now, we've already integrated with all of the major speech providers, all of them actually. We've integrated with the major map providers. We've integrated with all of these telephony and other services. So that pre-integration work's already been done. So the heavy lifting is already done and really makes it much easier for a car company to adopt AGL and reduce that time to market and, and really uh, eliminate that um, fragmentation by making a long-term investment in AGL and building their own platform based on AGL. So that's really the goal of the project. We're strongly a code-first organization. Um, the reason we believe very strongly in this is because uh, the automotive industry is very specification heavy. Um, <laughs> uh, so very specification heavy. So. Uh, there's a tendency to produce documents and having companies be compliant to the document, right? So we wanted to avoid that because other organizations have tried this. Another organization called Geneva Alliance had a specification and what happened is you had vendor A, vendor B, vendor C all claiming to be compliant to the spec but when you look at the software stack it's different kernel versions, different versions of packages, it's just not the same software stack. So we're back to square one which is fragmentation. So at AGL, we said we're not doing that. There's no compliance program and there's no spec. Now, it doesn't mean it's the Wild West. You know, we have documentation, we document things, we document APIs, but we don't want to have a compliance program where we end up having uh, a supplier saying, hey, I'm compliant, uh, use my software stack, because then we'll end up back to square one, like I said, which is fragmentation where uh, multiple platforms will exist all over the place. Uh, so for this reason, the only starting point for an AGL project is the AGL website. You download the latest stable version, start your project, you're guaranteed to have true AGL. So what have we been uh, working on? So the very first uh, thing we focused on was infotainment. Um, so this is, you know, in the center console with your maps, your telephony, your radio. Um, that's the first thing we focused on because that was the biggest pain point. We've been releasing software for that now since 2016. So that's very mature, um, and I'll show you it's being used in production. Um, then we focused on instrument cluster. That is one of our most exciting uh, projects right now. Uh, we have a couple of car companies that are actually planning to deploy within the next year an AGL-based instrument cluster. And I can't mention who yet, but this is happening now, and this will be on the streets very soon. We also have heads-up display and telematics. All of these share the same code base where telematics is the, I would say, the most dumbed down, meaning that you know, we, we rip out all the graphics, the 3D, all of that stuff, and we're left with pretty much just uh, the base OS with all of the radio stacks and the ability to communicate to the cloud for uh, you know, telematics type services. Um, and then also we're working on functional safety. I'll talk about that uh, in a slide a little bit later. And AGL is being used by several companies as the base of uh, advanced driver assistance, ADAS type of applications as well. Overall, we have uh, 11 car manufacturers supporting the project. Uh, pretty good geography in terms of world coverage. We have uh, Honda, Mazda, Mitsubishi, Nissan, Suzuki, Toyota in Japan. Pretty much all the major ones. We have Ford in the US, Hyundai in South Korea, we have Mercedes and Volkswagen in Germany and SAIC in China. Uh, if you count the cars from all these companies, it's about 50 to 60% of worldwide vehicles. And when we mention Volkswagen Group, uh, it's actually the entire group. Um, and we know that several of these uh, are using AGL. And uh, I met with Bugatti and I requested a car. <laughs> I said, you know, I'll give me a car and I'll test your uh, software, make sure it works. And they said, heck no. <laughs> they, only, they only sold 42 cars in America that year and they said, you're not getting one then. I said, okay, that's too bad. <laughs> what about a Lamborghini then? <laughs> um, anyways, <laughs> I still don't have either one, so, uh, so much for that. Um, <laughs> Overall, we have 150, uh, over 150 companies. We have uh, all the uh, car manufacturers that I mentioned. We have big tier one companies, uh, Denso, Panasonic, um, Aishin, Continental, Harman, Bosch. Those are all you know, the biggest tier ones in the world. They're all members 
Uh, we also have most of the semiconductor providers to automotive industry, so uh, Renesas, Qualcomm, NXP, TI, uh, NVIDIA, uh, ARM, uh, Intel, et cetera. Um, and then lately, because we've kind of tapped out the, the members that are automotive, pure automotive companies, we're now getting a lot of companies that are not pure automotive companies, but they want to participate in uh, you know, connected car in the cloud, and a good example is Adobe. Adobe is not joining to be put a PDF in your car. They're actually, they have an analytics business that tracks IoT endpoints and, and consumer data. And so that's why they're interested in being part of our ecosystem. Uh, so we're really attracting a wider ecosystem now of, of connected car companies. Uh, the very first car to uh, ship with AGL was the 2018 Toyota Camry. And since then, uh, virtually all Toyota and Lexus in the world run with AGL. Sub all the Subaru in the world have AGL. Uh, Mercedes-Benz van Mercedes -Benz vans also. Uh, some Mazdas. Uh, several others are about to come out. You, you know, this project was started, like I said, 2016 is when we started the code. Uh, it takes about four years for car companies to go through a cycle. And some of them started about four or five years ago. So, you know, we're, we're going to start seeing a lot of cars on the road in the next couple of years. In terms of uh, market share, um, AGL is the market leader in terms of supported OS. Uh, so that's the orange line. You can see we have quite a market lead over Android. This is not my chart. This is from a company called IHS Market. They, tr they track these things. Um, and you can see Android Automotive is, is obviously climbing. Generic Linux, I call it generic Linux because there are a lot of cars with Linux out there, but they're not AGL. Those are kind of, that's going down over time because they're being replaced with AGL. All these companies are realizing, well, why, why not get on board with the actual automotive version of Linux? Uh, and then the gray one up there is actually a fork of Android, mostly used in China, uh, with no Google support, no Google updates, no security updates, no Google services, no Google Maps. So it, it's really a fork. You take it, you copy it, you're on your own kind of thing. So that's uh, the gray one. Anyways, overall, so we're, we're kind of hanging in there quite well. And the projection is that you know the market will be eventually about 50-50, 50% AGL, 50% Android. That's kind of what the analysts are thinking, which I'm really happy, <laughs> happy with. OK, let's switch to software and the stuff we're actually working on. Um, our software is called UCB. It stands for Unified Codebase. And we chose that name to send a message to the market that we're trying to eliminate this fragmentation I was talking about. Um, we name our releases after Fish. <laughs> our community manager, uh, Walt Miner, came up with this idea. Uh, Android was naming things after desserts. We said, well, we need something cool. And uh, so we, we named them after Fish. Agile Albacore, like I mentioned earlier, January 2016 was our very first release, uh, all the way to Lucky Lamprey. The point of this chart is not to show you some Fish. It's to actually explain to you that we do two releases per year. And we follow kind of a TikTok model, like uh, if you're familiar with the Intel TikTok model, uh, you know, one is, uh, you know, new node and the next one is, you know, uh, 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 fe less features, but more, you know, like uh, more performance and things like that. So we follow a similar model where the first release of the year is uh, feature rich because we do a lot of demos at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, so it's feature rich. And the second release in the year, kind of the summer time frame, tends to be more um, uh, hardening, security fixes, bug fixes. And so our members know this, so they tend to take the summer release as a starting point for production projects. And the two latest release are N Nifty Needlefish, released in August. Uh, so that's the one that you know some companies are using for production. And then the next uh, one that we just released is Optimistic Octopus. No, that's a mouthful. <laughs> uh, released in, just released in February. Uh, all of this stuff is on our wiki. Everything is public. You can go, you can read the release notes, you can download the code. There's nothing, nothing private. Some parts of the website may require a Linux Foundation ID, um, which is, uh, which is you know, just a fact. <clears throat> um, in terms of expert groups, um, we have a, so the way AGL is, is uh, structured is that we have, ex, we have a bottom-up approach where we have expert groups, then we have, and, and they meet you know, weekly, every two weeks, conference calls, Zoom, 
uh, in person across the world sometimes. Uh, and then above that, we have a system architecture team that oversees the end-to-end -end architecture, coding guidelines, things like that. And above that, we have a steering committee. And the steering committee oversees the big decisions, like what features are, are we going to work on? What are the priorities? And above that, we have a board of directors, um, which meets every quarter and decides where the money is going to go and what we're going we're to spend on. So the expert groups really are empowered to make decisions in those these areas. Now we work on stuff that is not covered by expert groups, so this is not all that AGL works on. There's other things we work on. We may not have an expert group for it, but there could be a few developers working on something. Um, the, I think the most active ones at this point are the instrument cluster. That's a really active expert group. They're working on really cool stuff, and I'll talk about it a little bit later. Vehicle to cloud is really active and, and important. And then container and service mesh and virtualization, we actually recently merged into a, a new work group or expert group called Software Defined Vehicles, uh, SDV. So this is what the overall expert groups look like. Um, as I mentioned, SDV is brand new, right off, hot off the presses from last month. So let's talk about some of the software trend, or the vehicle software trends and how AGL is addressing them. So one trend that you hear all the time is companies building their own OS. VW.OS, Mercedes-Benz.OS, you know, Toyota OS. It's, if you're a geek and a tech guy like me, that's not the right use of the word OS, <laughs> in my opinion. Uh, you know, I'm a computer engineer by trade. I've coded for many, many years, and I don't see this as an OS. What these people really mean when they talk about that is a service delivery platform. They're talking an end-to-end -end from the vehicle to the cloud, services for the consumer, data tracking, where they go, this kind of stuff. That's what they mean by OS. Okay, it's an overloaded term, overused. What they're really using at the base of this is AGL and or Linux and or components of both, right? And this is what they're using. Like Mercedes is a big supporter of AGL, so is Volkswagen. They're using AGL as the basis for the in-vehicle portion. And then they partner with some of our big members like Amazon and so on for cloud-based services. And that's what they're calling the end-to-end -end OS. So AGL is at the center of these things. Um, another trend is that the, the SOX, the SOC processors in the vehicles are becoming very powerful, right? Uh, four core, eight core, little cores, big cores, <laughs> lots of cores. Um, it's, you know, no, they're, very, they're very powerful processors, very powerful graphics. Um, and what we're seeing is the attempt to consolidate a lot of the cockpit features onto a single processor. And at AGL, we've been doing this for actually for many years. I think our very first demonstration of this was 2017, where we showed AGL instrument cluster running side by side with AGL infotainment on the same processor in a virtualized environment. And you can do it with containers, you can do it with open source hypervisors, and you can do it with proprietary hypervisors, commercial ones, no problem. We've shown actually all three variants of this. And this is a trend that is definitely happening. We know of at least one, maybe two, actual production projects that have started to do this and actually ship it in a real vehicle, where you're going to see the instrument cluster and the infotainment on one processor with two different screens. And that's, that's really, really cool. And AGL is at the center of that. Another trend is the growing software complexity and scale. Um, I don't know what our latest numbers are, but we're well over 100 million lines of code at AGL. Um, so it's extremely complex. A lot of bug fixes, a lot of security fixes. And ma managing all of this is new for the car companies because they're not used to that kind of environment and, and they're learning, right? So we created the Container and Service Mesh Expert Group, which is, as I mentioned, now renamed Software Defined Vehicles with the goal to simplify the deployment of, I, I like to call it the cloudification of the vehicle, where uh, we treat the software in the vehicle more like a server, so that we're able to put, using things like containers, push updates and push entire images to the vehicle, more, and, and really kind of employ what the IT world has done for years, 
employ those same concepts and those same engineers. So you don't need, embedded engineers are really hard to find. In the industry, you know, there's, there's, they're, they're a rare breed. And to find embedded engineers and to have this whole up, upgrade process based on embedded software is very difficult. So there's a whole trend and some members at AGL, including Amazon is leading this actually, Amazon AWS is leading this effort for us, uh, to treat it like a server and push updates to the vehicle like a server. And so we're, we'll see where this evolves, but this is ongoing and they're working on this now in the new SDV uh, expert group. And then this brings me to the final one, which is very much everything I just talked about, which is the lines are blurring between embedded IT and cloud. And we think we're, we're you know, it's the cloudification of the vehicle, as I mentioned. And we think we're really addressing this by um, uh, having the vehicle to cloud expert group work very closely with the new SDV uh, expert group and um, addressing these needs and these uh, features, things like uh, you know protocols for over the air, et cetera. So we're working on all of these things right now and uh, we're really seeing this blurring of embedded and cloud. <clears throat> Other key developments, um, at AGL we actually build our own hardware that may sound weird for an open source software project, but uh, if you're in the automotive industry, you know that getting hardware boards are extremely difficult. You have to sign agreements with the vendor, you have to sign NDAs most of the time, uh, and then you have to pay you know, $1,000, $2,000 for a development board. So it's, it's very time consuming, very expensive. So our community wanted to have another option. So what we did is we, we designed from scratch an actual automotive uh, reference board. Uh, it has, it, we call it the sandwich. Uh, the vehicle board has all the vehicle peripherals, things like cameras and you know, side detection and things like that. Then there's a peripheral board that has audio uh, and things like that. And then the control board, which has the SOC. And the idea is that we can swap the SOC with a different one without affecting the software, meaning that the AGL image for that board will run perfectly fine. And to take it a step further, there's actually one car company that wants to do this in production. So they want to be able to use this sandwich approach where if they have a shortage of an SOC or a vendor problem or a cost problem, they can quickly switch to a new one in the same production line. That's pretty innovative because that's never been done before. Uh, and so this, this concept, this whole uh, reference hardware uh, team concept was was uh, started for this reason. And we think that that's a really cool, innovative thing that's going on. Uh, we're gonna add, we currently have the Renaissance SOC support, and we're gonna add Qualcomm uh, very soon. I said Q1, we missed that deadline. Uh, I heard it's coming out soon. <clears throat> Another cool development is that we're adding uh, more options to run and test AGL. So we're running AGL on AWS uh, Graviton, which is a cloud-based, ARM64 based architecture. Amazon AWS has been helping us with this. They've ported AGL to this architecture. Uh, I heard this is just about to be released. I think they're ready to go. So uh, stay tuned for that. It should be available probably by the end of this month. Um, and what this does is it alleviates, again, alleviates the need for an engineer to have a physical piece of hardware. And especially post COVID, a lot of us are working at home now. It's kind of almost permanent for many companies. Uh, this allows them to do a lot of their development, their testing, et cetera, using a cloud-based environment, they don't, and they can do it from home. Uh, so they don't need physical hardware. So this is a really cool uh, development. <clears throat> Another really um, exciting thing is Flutter. So uh, if you're not familiar with Flutter, it's an app and UI development uh, toolkit. It's an alternative to Qt for those that know what Qt is. And it was developed by uh, Google and completely open sourced. And what Toyota did is they modified, they took it and modified it and added several automotive uh, type features. And then they recontributed all that code back to AGL. So we're the home of that automotive flutter uh, right now. So we have, uh, I think it was like a million lines of code contribution. Um, and it's a great opportunity for AGL to be competitive with Android in terms of ease of application development. Um, and we strongly believe, because of the people we talk to in the industry, that Flutter will become the de facto uh, standard for automotive for app UI uh, development. Uh, so yeah, so we're, we've already moved all of our apps from Qt to Flutter, uh, and all, any new apps that we're developing will be uh, Flutter-based. 
In terms of virtualization, um, this is, uh, we're working uh, very closely on Vert.io. This is being led uh, personally by the CTO of Panasonic. Uh, uh, and it, it so happens that Panasonic also did all the Vert.io work for Android. It's the same people, it's the same code base. Why this, is, why this is so exciting is because it allows AGL to be run anywhere, cloud natively or on a physical SOC. Uh, using Vert.io as uh, the standard virtualization for uh, I.O. And what's also nice about this, it opens up another opportunity for AGL because for companies that have chosen Android for whatever reason, which is fine, um, you can run AGL instrument cluster side by side with Android in a Vert.io environment. And that's really cool. We've already demonstrated that because uh, I, I'm pretty sure Android or Google is not interested in instrument cluster because that's a completely different type of application, it's quite difficult. Um, but we are, and we're, we're working on it already, so this is an opportunity for us to uh, be in the cockpit where Android is the infotainment. In terms of events, uh, if you'd like to participate in our community and attend some of our events, we just had the AGL AMM Berlin. I'm just showing it because um, we had to deal with that giant uh, aquarium explosion. I don't know if you guys read about that. That was, that was the hotel we were going to be in uh, and just two weeks before our event or three weeks, that giant aquarium blew up and uh, we had to find a new venue. So that, that was fun. <laughs> um, anyway, so we pulled it off and we had that event uh, in Berlin. Uh, we also attended Embedded World. So if you're there uh, next year, come see us. We're going to have a booth there as well. We, we do this every year, this show. Um, we're going to be uh, at a new show called Embedded Open Source Summit, which is in June. Uh, this is brand new for Linux Foundation. It kind of replaces the old Embedded Linux Con, ELC. Uh, and it uh, brings together a lot of embedded different uh, sub-projects, Zephyr, us, you know, several others. So we're going to be there. Uh, full day will be uh, Automotive Linux Summit Europe, we're calling it. And that'll be June 27th um, in Prague. And then we're going to have our all-member meeting in Tokyo, July 11 to 13. That'll be at the Hilton Tokyo Shinjuku. So you can join us for that if you're a member. And then finally, ALS OSS Japan will be December 5 and 6 at the Adiaki Convention Center uh, in Japan. And our biggest show of the year in terms of public uh, exposure is the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. We're going to be there next to Mercedes, John Deere, a lot of automotive companies uh, all around us. Uh, this is a cool event for us. And as a member, and I'm plugging it a little bit here, but if you're a member of AGL, it's also a very inexp inexpensive way to participate in CES because this costs, you know, like a half million dollars. <laughs> uh, and you can participate for very little cost and have a kiosk and participate in our ecosystem in our booth. Um, so that's my plug. <laughs> So that's all I have, and I think we have time for questions. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, you know, rework's a very expensive part of production, and electronics are a hard part of that, but you didn't talk much about testing. Yeah, I mean, we, we have a CI and test expert group. Yeah. Um, I didn't have really much time to cover it today, but we have a complete expert group on that. Yeah. And we have actually a full suite of automated testing that we run every single build. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a big part of what we do, yeah. yeah. Your uh, reference hardware, Yeah. how much does it cost and where can we get it? I don't know what the latest price is because there's been SOC shortages and prices have gone up. Check our Confluence page on the AGL wiki, but it's not that expensive. It's like under 1000 I think it was like five, six hundred at one point. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, why Flutter instead of like web technologies? Well, a big part is because our uh, one of our big champions is Toyota, and they chose Flutter, and they kind of pushed their ecosystem of suppliers to support Flutter. So it's kind of become the de facto standard. Now, it may it may not yet be the de facto standard in Europe or you know Germany yet. But I know that they're also using it and looking at it. So it's, 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 it's not up to me, but <laughs> it seems the industry, that's where they're going. And, and if one other big manufacturer in Europe jumps on board, it, Flutter will become the standard, I, I believe. That's my opinion. <clears throat> yep. Changes. 
I don't know. That's a good question. Um, that would be a good question for some of our community members. They, they might know that. I don't know that, unfortunately. Yeah. So we actually, I think I, I have a slide on that, but I may have hidden it. <laughs> uh, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have that slide. But yeah, we, we're working closely with um, ELISA, which is another Linux Foundation project. And um, we are a member of ELISA, and uh, my, our community manager, Walt Miner, is actually uh, kind of heading the automotive work group. Uh, so we're participating in all the meetings. Uh, I think there's a meeting in, I forget, in, uh, in Berlin coming up in June, so we intend to participate in that as well. Uh, the goal is, so our, our biggest champion is Suzuki. Um, they're using, uh, instrument cluster for their production, and they want to bring uh, this instrument cluster for AGL to functional safety certification, and they're working with a big tier one to do it. And what they're going to do is once they're done with that, they're going to contribute everything back, all the artifacts, the testing, the documentation, they're going to contribute all of that back to AGL. Now, that doesn't mean AGL will be certified. We don't plan to do that, of course, because we're not running on the final hardware. We're always reference hardware. But we do plan to have everything ready as much as possible to make, the, you know, make it as painful, uh, painless as possible for the manufacturer to, not as painful. <laughs> Functional safety and pain is normally associated, but uh, to make it as painless as possible for the manufacturer to go get certified. That's our goal. Oh, and let me add also, so what people do today, like when I was with Monta Vista, we did the Chevy Volt instrument cluster, and we didn't get certification for the Linux part. We did a graphical overlay and had a small RTOS. So their RTOS did all the functional safety critical things, which was certified, and Linux did all the graphics, fancy 3D, you know, with the, and we just did a graphical overlay for the things that are critical, and that's how we got away with it. Well, got away with it. It's, it's approved. <laughs> it's an approved method of getting away with it. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yep. What's your favorite car? <laughs> uh, I drive a BMW M550, and it doesn't run AGL. <laughs> but, uh, but my next car m may run AGL, because, yeah, I have a few in mind. <laughs> Yeah. That's okay, that's a great question. That's a constant debate. Um, we have members, big car companies, and I won't name them because we're on video, <laughs> but that tell us they don't want us to do security because they're ultimately responsible, and they have this whole back end infrastructure people that take care of it. They don't want us to spend time and effort reproducing what they have to do anyway. But then we have another set of members that says, no, 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 you have to do some security, you know. So we're kind of in the middle. We don't do the full-blown production level type of, but we do, we're part of the advanced notifications of security, pro, you know, all these things. We're plugged into those and we get patches and we patch things before the, the public knows. Um, so we do some amount, but not, the full thing. And it's a constant debate at AGL. How much security do we do? You know, how much effort do we spend? How much money do we spend on this? Um, but in the end, each manufacturer is responsible. And in the end, they have lawyers. And in the end, they won't, don't want to be liable. So they have to do it anyway. No matter how much we do, they have to do it anyway. So that's the bottom line. <clears throat> Yeah, I may have to remove a few because I may not have the permission to show some logos, but yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, last call. All right. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>